I'm Steve Cooper, and I'm not the reason you're here, uh, but I get a chance to introduce uh, Jeff. So um, I have a brief bio I'm going to read of Jeff, which is pretty boring, and then I'll tell you a couple of stories of just myself, uh, which hopefully will be better than the brief bio. So um, throughout his life, Jeff Rakes has always felt compelled to reinvest in society through philanthropy. Through his work at Microsoft, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and fueled by his own experience as a father, Jeff has a strong passion for supporting young people as they navigate life post high school. It's with this passion that he and his wife, Trisha, founded the Rakes Foundation, an organization that focuses on helping young people reach their full potential. Because of their generosity and desire to give back, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln dedicated the Jeffrey S. Rakes School of Computer Science and Management in 2000, Business Management in 2008, a premier program that combines the sectors of computer science and business. And I tell you just two brief stories before Jeff, I turn it over. And, um, for my former life at Stanford, I got a chance to, to, to meet and interact with and have uh, uh, work with many powerful, mostly men, unfortunately, in Silicon Valley, um, some of whom funded my research and my individual projects on which I was working. At a certain point, I got to realize that their support of my projects was more about them. For example, if they were supporting perhaps an outreach program I was running, they actually wanted to personally benefit them or their families or something along the lines of that. And I remember when I first had a conversation with Jeff back in the summer of 2015, and my to-be boss, Alan Weisinger, warned me. He said, oh, he's going to be a real tough Silicon Valley type. Be careful on this. <laughs> and Jeff wasn't like that at all. And at the end of my conversation, I realized what the difference was. Jeff isn't about Jeff. Jeff is about Nebraska, about the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and about the school. And that was such a difference. And I remember talking to, I remember talking to Alan and I said, you were completely wrong about Jeff. I know about Silicon Valley guys. And Jeff may be from the West Coast, but he's not even close to one of those. My second story, real brief before I turn the phone over, is I recently read Dale Russikoff's fascinating book called The Prize. And it's a story of Mark Zuckerberg's $100 million gift to the Newark Public Schools. And you should all take a look. It's a fascinating read. And it's a very close book. They allowed this Washington Post reporter to be embedded on the project for a couple of years. For all, any of you guys who don't know, the entire $100 million was wasted. No change happened to the Newark Public Schools. And so the study was why. And so the four primary characters, of course, Mark, uh, Governor Chris Christie, um, now Senator Cory Booker, and then the woman, uh, Cammie Anderson, was brought in to uh, run the uh, Newark Public Schools. And the problem was Mark wrote a beautiful check and then came back once a year to check on the progress. He wasn't at all invested. And what Mark learned, and the interesting story, and I'll ruin the story for you, is only one person from those four learned anything, and that was Mark. And it was only a cost of $100 million. What's that between friends? Um, and what he learned Especially was the money was necessary, but it wasn't sufficient. That he had to be involved in the life and helping others to guide all of the challenges that the Newark Public Schools were going to make. And, you know, I'm admired so much by Jeff and Tricia and that they haven't just wrote a check and disappeared after that, that they're still so engaged with the school. They're always back all of the time. I can count on them. The students count on them. Heck, the students. Uh, uh, Tricia mentors so many of the young women. It's like so cool to, to see this. And I think that makes all of the difference in the world. So without further ado, you don't want to hear me anymore. Let's turn the floor over to Jeff and uh, welcome him. Super. I got my You got my Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much. It's great to see such a large crowd today. There must be a football game tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful to have all of you here. Now, one of the things I want to uh, explain right out of the gate is we're spending a lot of time talking about the 10th anniversary of the Rake School. And while Trisha and I really appreciate that, I actually think it's really important to put it in the context of the real history here. And it was almost 21 years ago that the University of Nebraska Foundation had reached out to me to ask if I would help them conceive of what a world-class computer science facility would be here at the University of Nebraska. And it was an anticipation of a $30 million gift uh, to create that kind of a, a school or a facility. And I spent some time doing the research. I talked to one of my colleagues at Microsoft, a gentleman named Rick Rashid. He ran computer science at Carnegie Mellon, so 
He knows what world-class computer science is, and he basically discouraged me from trying to do it here. And his basic point was that world-class computer science, as defined by academia, is largely about getting a lot of research dollars, a lot of, of graduate students, so on and so forth. And I, I was not excited about that, to be honest. You know, one of the key observations that Bill Gates and I had at Microsoft is that we would find great talent, deep technical talent, but not people that had sort of the business acumen, aptitude, and leadership skills. Or we'd find people that had those business skills, but not the technology skills. And I knew the gentleman who was going to potentially make this gift. His name was Ed McVaney. For those of you who don't know, he was the founder of J.D. Edwards. It was one of the great uh, enterprise resource planning systems or accounting systems uh, in the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I reached out to Ed and I said, Ed, I don't really think we should try and do what most people would think in terms of world-class computer science. I don't think this is what he and I wanted. And so I wrote a, an email uh, on October 15, 1997 to Ed, and I sketched out what I thought would be an industry-oriented computer science facility, world-class, that was really about teaching great undergraduate students an interdisciplinary education. This is a, I found last night, this is an excerpt from that email where I lay out this notion of industry versus research-oriented research computer science, and Ed says, your memo is right on. So I think the real thank you has to go to Ed McVaney, because he was willing to invest in this idea and make what was then called the J.D. Edwards Honors Program uh, a success here at, at uh, the University of Nebraska that was then later renamed to be the Rake School. So I just wanted to have you to have, all have that context because we all owe a lot of gratitude for, for Ed and will, being willing to invest in the idea and the, the early days. So with the history out of the way, I want to begin on the theme that I, I sketched out here, which is lessons for a life of, of purpose. And especially for all the students here, but for all of you, I want you to take a moment and think. I want you to think about what are your values? What do you value? What's important to you? Think about it. We're going to be short on time today, otherwise I'd ask you to engage in a dialogue with me about it, but I hope what you'll do is you'll come away from this topic and you'll write down what it is that you value. What are the values that are important to you? For me, one of the values that I learned growing up in Nebraska is work ethic. I learned to drive a tractor when I was seven years old. I started working in our fields uh, and on our farm when I was nine years old. Another value I learned was the importance of passion for what you do. My mother uh, was a, a very strong woman. Some of the people here today uh, know my mom. Uh, she set a tone in our family. It wasn't so much that I had to beat the other guy but it was certainly important to Alice Rakes that I be the best that I could be. She taught that sort of internal competitiveness that was important, and I value that. I value honesty and integrity. You want to work with people you trust. I value a sense of community. The town where I went to, to high school was only 2,000 people, but that was actually a great way to grow up. It instills in you that sense of community. So those are some of the values that I learned growing up in our community in Nebraska and on our farm. And I think it's very important for you to reflect on your values because this is lesson number one. Core values shape who you are as a leader and the culture of your organization. Your core values. 
and also for you as an individual, they shape your personal brand, who you are, the attributes that you hold yourself accountable to. So that's a, a very important lesson, and I hope you'll take some time to think about that. What I'm going to do today, given a short period of time, and, and I'm going to apologize up front. I had so much I wanted to share with you, uh, and I, I had a very difficult time deciding how to whittle it down. And so I'm going to go through a lot of topics, a lot of lessons, very quickly. Uh, and I hope that I get the opportunity over the years to come to engage with you and talk more about them in, in depth. So I'm going to apologize that I'm going to touch on a lot of things quickly, but I hope that you'll take away the things that are most interesting to you, the things that you want to engage in a dialogue with Tricia uh, or me about. So, I'm going to talk about some lessons from my growing up and my career, some business and strategy lessons, some lessons on leadership, and I'm going to end with some lessons that I think are important for you to think about in terms of the life that you want to live. So, <clears throat> I am very lucky. I grew, my family have been farming in Nebraska since 1854. We've been farming just outside Ashland since 1900. Uh, and I just got to tell you, I'm damn proud to be a Nebraskan. That was a big part of, of what defined me in, in my life. In fact, one of my favorite quips from Warren Buffett, Warren, I, I know it'll surprise you, he has a lot of wealthy friends. And, you know, they have homes in, you know, Monaco and, and you know, Palm Springs and Palm Beach and, Warren likes to say he's got a home in Omaha because it's a symbol of status. <laughs> I love the fact that I got to, to grow up here. And as I mentioned, uh, working on our farm, uh, I learned a lot of important lessons that instilled in values in me. One of the important lessons I learned was work balance. Now, people here in Nebraska kind of get what I'm about to say, but when I'm outside you know, like when I'm back in the, the West Coast, when I say work balance, they think I mean work-life balance. And the reason they're confused is they don't understand that when you work on a farm, there is no other life than work. <laughs> you know, so when I talk about work balance, I talk about the fact that every farm kid wants to get up that day and drive the tractor or the combine. But some days you get to drive the tractor, and some days you scoop hog manure. <laughs> that is work balance. And that was one of the things I learned growing up on the farm. You know, in those days at Microsoft where I got to do really fun things, share the new products that we were doing, that was like driving the tractor. There were other days, people issues or our business problems or competitive challenges, they weren't as good. But the fact that I grew up and I learned work balance, I recognized that that's just the way life is. Some days you get to drive the tractor, and some days you scoop hog manure. So always remember work balance. But another uh, anecdote I want to share actually has to do with a snow snowstorm. Uh, most of you have grown up here or in the Midwest. Uh, if you didn't, you know, maybe you've already been here for a winter, so you know what it can be like. And I remember when I was about 10 or 12 years old, there was a snowstorm, and uh, it was one of those blizzard-type conditions. And there was a couple in their car, I think they were probably from Omaha or Lincoln, and they got stuck in a snowdrift near our, our house. And so they came knocking on the door, uh, looking for help. It was about 10 below zero. Uh, my dad answered. He was quick to offer help and even quicker to offer me. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we got, a, we got a tractor, we got a chain, we got them pulled out of the snow drift, and we got them going on the road. And the couple were very appreciative and they reached into their pocket and they tried to give my dad some money. And my dad said, oh, no, 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 no. He wasn't going to take any money from them. But he just hoped 
that if any point in the future one of his children faced a challenge or a difficulty, that the people around them would reach out and help them. I will always remember that story. That was my parents emphasizing the value of paying it forward, the value of community service, of giving back to your community. And I think as you can see <clears throat> from you know, the trajectory that Trisha and I have chosen in our life, we think a lot about how we pay it forward. So that's the second lesson I wish to share with you today. Now I'm gonna move on, talk a little bit about some other aspects of my career. I, I didn't go to the University of Nebraska. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I did go to a pretty, school out, pretty good school out on the West Coast. Now why did I do that? My dad had read an article that Stanford University had the best business school. And my dad actually, though he was a farmer, his degree was in chemical engineering, and he felt it was more important that I get a business degree than an agricultural degree. And so, you know, in that sense, if there had been an inter, you know, interdisciplinary combination, maybe that was the thing to do, but he said, Jeff, you should go to, to Stanford, they have the best business school, you should get a business degree. <clears throat> I visited when I was a senior in high school. Uh, it was over the Christmas holiday. Uh, it was about 12 below zero in Nebraska. It was 72 degrees as I drove down Palm Drive. I turned to my mother and I said, I want to go here. Uh, amazingly, I got in. Uh, and to be honest, I was pretty clueless about college choices. Uh, and I, I got in and I got to Stanford and in my first weekend, the orientation weekend, I discovered something. Stanford has no undergraduate business school. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm there, and I'm thinking, okay, well, well now what do I do? And so I, I think I'm pretty good in math and science, so I go to uh, the engineering uh, fair, uh, or you know, they had like a picnic, and I run into a professor named Bill Linville, and uh, fortunately for me, he had grown up on a hog farm in Missouri, so we were simpatico. Uh, and he took me under his wing and said, oh, it'll be okay, we're gonna design, you know, he wanted to work with me to design a degree in engineering economic systems, and, and, and so, okay, I decided to do that. And as part of that, I needed to take engineering calculus. And, Again, I thought I was pretty good in math and science, and, but you know, I'd come from a small high school. My class was about 75. Uh, about 15 of, of my class went on to, to college. And, and you know, I was pretty good in high school, but I, I probably didn't quite know how to study. I, you know, before that first calculus midterm, I took the textbook and tried to read it. Uh, some of you are laughing. Yeah, I, I, I get it. Uh, and, I got a 47 on a midterm where the median was 80. And I thought, okay, my academic career at Stanford is over. Seriously. Uh, you know, that's a big blow. You know, you all were very successful in high school and you, you know, got great grades and you know, suddenly you're in a situation like that, and, and how do you respond? I thought I should probably drop out. So I went to see the professor, uh, Peter Winkler, and I said, Peter, or Professor Winkler, I'm sure is what I said, uh, <laughs> you know, I guess I'm not cut out for Stanford. And he said, oh, no, 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 Jeff, you don't understand. Two-thirds of this class had calculus in high school. One-third had a full year. I said, whoa, I took advanced math in my high school. That was trigonometry. <laughs> and, he said, and he said, furthermore, they get all kind of cocky, uh, and we burn through most of what they learned in high school through the first midterm. What you need to do is you need to learn how to study. You got to go do the problem sets, the previous year's midterm, so you learn how to do those, those, those problem sets. And because they get kind of cocky, you're probably going to be just fine. And so I did what Peter Winkler said. I got a 92 on the next midterm, 
and the median was 67. Peter Winkler changed my life. I almost dropped out of Stanford University. It's a little weird to think of the near dropout as now the chairman of the board of Stanford <laughs> University. But it's a very important lesson. You need to have a growth mindset. When you encounter these kinds of challenges, when you, when you encounter failure, what you have to do is you have to seek support from those around you, you have to learn from the situation, and you should be grateful for that support. Pay it back to those teachers, to those people around you that have helped you. Now, Bill Linville, the professor in engineering economic systems, Professor Linville and I designed a degree in engineering economic systems for me to go work for the USDA in agriculture, uh, agricultural policy. I thought that would be a good thing for the farm kid from Nebraska to do, and, and so we did that. But another funny thing happened along the way. My senior year in college, I bought an Apple computer to help my brother run our family farm. An Apple computer came onto campus, and I thought, well, I, you know, I should learn how to do job interviews. I'd always, even during, you know, while you guys are doing great internships in this program, I was working on our family farm during the summers when I was going to Stanford. So I thought, okay, I gotta learn how to do job interviews. I interviewed with this company called VisiCal, or Apple Computer, and they offered me the job of being the VisiCalc engineering manager. You all don't know VisiCalc, but you do know Microsoft Excel. VisiCalc was the grandfather of Microsoft Excel. It was the first electronic spreadsheet. So that leads to another very important lesson. One that I learned, another lesson I learned from my father. It's very important to have a plan, but be open to opportunity. My dad was a chemical engineer, was working for Standard Oil of California during the Depression. My family farm was going under. My dad literally and figuratively saved the farm. And he turned that into a great business. He had a plan, but he was open to opportunity. And so that is a third lesson that I think is very important for you to take, home, take away. Now, at Apple Computer, I learned two or three really important things. I loved VisiCalc. I mean, just think about what you can do with Excel as a modeling tool. The ways in which you can manipulate it to solve particular problems. Or, and I, would, I was responsible for doing lots of VisiCalc modeling or spreadsheet modeling. Things, I'd figured out how to do a PERT chart, uh, which is a project management tool in VisiCalc. And I'd spend all night trying to solve these puzzles in VisiCalc, the spreadsheet, and then I'd come in the next morning and I would demo it to people. I would show it to them and their eyes would light up because they could see the power of the tool that was created. I fell in love with software. I just thought the fact that you could do that was freaking amazing. And the second thing I learned working at Apple Computers. When you work for uh, Apple Computers, it's a hardware company, at least that's how they define themselves then. They're really about their hardware. They're about, they're not, software is just a way for them to sell the box. So if you work for a place like Microsoft, software is life itself. So shortly after I'd only been at Apple Computer, not even a year and a half, I was recruited by this kind of crazy guy named Steve Ballmer to come up to, to Microsoft. And as I said, I learned two to three things. I learned I love software. I learned hardware companies weren't about software. The other thing I learned is stock options. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, do, I do have the distinction of being the first uh, holder of stock options in Microsoft Corporation. So that, that turned out pretty well. Uh, <laughs> But before I left, I got this phone call, a very angry phone call from a guy named Steve Jobs. Steve had wanted me to work on the Mac. I would have been the seventh person on the Apple Macintosh team. But the Mac is about hardware, and, or at least Steve was, and I wanted to go to Microsoft. So make a long story short, in this angry phone call, uh, him yelling at me, he 
basically switches into what we used to call the Steve Jobs reality distortion field. Uh, he was very charming at times, and he tried to explain to me how Microsoft was going to go out of business. <laughs> and this is 1981. I, it was pretty funny to think about how that all, uh, that all happened. So Steve does that, and I just think to myself, well, you know, he may be right, but in my case, you know, what's the worst thing that happened? Maybe I go back to our farm. That's actually pretty good. I'm okay with that. Boom, I hung up. The point I want to make here, Steve might have been right. Steve Jobs may have been right. Microsoft might have gone out of business. We, it was just a $12 million software company. We didn't think there would ever be a $100 million software company. But the lesson is to strive to have your work be your passion. And then the rewards will take care of themselves. I've had too many people close to me in my life who got all about the money, all about what they were going to get. My stock may never have been worth anything. I didn't care. I loved what I was doing. I was given the opportunity to be a part of creating Microsoft Office. That, to me, was mind-blowing. And so the lesson, strive to have your work be your passion, and the rewards will take care of themselves. So it was off to Microsoft, um, and uh, yeah, we quickly clicked through them. Um, it was a $12 million company, 100 employees. They had this fabulous uh, production manager in the marketing communications department named Tricia McGinnis. Uh, <laughs> now Tricia rakes. <laughs> We were the first couple to meet it and get married uh, at Microsoft. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a fabulous, it was a fabulous journey. Uh, and Microsoft, I started in product management, and then general management of a product group, and then Bill convinced me to switch over to sales and marketing, which I thought was the craziest thing in the world for me to run Microsoft North America, and then worldwide sales marketing and, and services, uh, and then ultimately president of the business division for Microsoft. The lesson here is that career management is your responsibility. I tried to do things that I enjoyed doing and that added value to the company. And that was the essence of my career management. And because I learned work balance, Growing up on the farm, almost anything they asked me to do, I was able to find those elements where I was driving the tractor. I didn't think I was going to like sales and marketing. I absolutely ended up loving it because I loved being out with our customers and our partners, sharing the, the magic of software and what it could do. That, to me, was uh, amazing. So the lesson is career management is your, your responsibility, and you should think of it as building a portfolio of assets. The fact that I had helped co-lead the creation of Microsoft Office, I knew the product side of Microsoft. The fact that I spent time leading our 72 subsidiaries around the world and all of those businesses, I knew our customers and our partners. And so by the time that they wanted me to be the head of the business division and reinvigorate Microsoft Office, I was very well prepared. I had a portfolio of assets that gave me incredible opportunities in my career, including, later on, the ability to lead the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which, you know, given that I didn't grow up in that area, was kind of, you know, in the area of philanthropy, was a little strange, but Bill and Melinda trusted me as a leader who had a broad set, a versatile set that, that could be applied. So think of your career as building a portfolio of assets. Now I'm going to switch over and I'm going to talk very quickly about some of the business and strategy lessons that I learned. And this, I'll be honest with you, this is the portion of my, my discussion where I, I cut it back a little bit due to time because I thought the most important thing was to share some of the career and leadership lessons. But there are a few here I want to, to emphasize. In 1987, uh, I went to Bill and I said, look, we have this, there's this company in, in Mountain View, California called Forethought, and they have software that helps you do overheads. 
you guys don't even know what an overhead is. I mean, overhead projectors with, you know, these, you know, plastic foil things, you know, et cetera. That's how we did presentations back then. Or if you're really sophisticated, you went to a firm that did 35 millimeter slides and you put it into a slide projector. That's how you did presentations. So it's a bill. There's this company that has software to do overheads. And he says, no, no, we don't want that. That's just a feature of Microsoft Word. And I said, no, Bill, it's really different. You know, it's kind of like you want to be able to sort of manage those foils or, you know, as they were sometimes called and so on and so forth. Anyway, it took me a while, but I finally convinced them to spring the $14 million to buy Forethought. And of course, that's PowerPoint. Five years later, People weren't using overhead projectors or slide projectors. They were plugging the computer right into a projector. About that same time, you'd be driving in a car and you'd have a phone in the car. It was called a car phone, very cleverly named. <laughs> and the idea that you'd have multiple people in a car having separate phone conversations at the same time, we never dreamed of that. It was a car phone. The point that you need to understand is that we as humans tend to overestimate change in the short term. We always think we'll get the software done before we actually do. But we tend to underestimate change in the long term. That's the lesson you need to take away. Things that you and I take for granted today, just like the whole world of social media, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was really thinking about those terms, or maybe just a very few, very few people. So, so we will overestimate change in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. That's another lesson for you to consider. I also want to share a, a little bit of a lesson related to Excel. Uh, the first version of Excel, which I'll explain later, was done on the Macintosh. Uh, it was 1984. Uh, we had very expensive, uh, actually, sorry, 1985. We had very expensive uh, laser printers. Laser printers then cost $5,000 or more. And so we were kind of cheap. We only had one in the office division. And the guy who was writing the code, Steve Hazelrig, didn't want to walk all the way down the hall to check out his printing code by seeing how it printed. So he wrote a little software routine with kind of a virtual magnifying glass so that he could put an image of the printed page up on the screen of the computer and see if his printing code was working properly. That's how Print Preview ended up in Microsoft Excel, and then Microsoft Office. No customer ever asked us for that feature. But the product designer, a guy named Jay Blumenthal, saw what Steve Hazelrig had done and said, wow, that would be a great feature for our customers. It is one of the absolutely most important lessons that you need to understand and know about great software design. You have to have complete empathy. You have to embrace human-centered design when you're thinking about what you want to do or build. You have to understand what, not just what they think their customer needs are, but what it is they really do. Jabe understood what our customers did. But our customers wouldn't know the technology to be able to ask for print preview. It's the confluence of those two things. An understanding of what your customers do so well combined with an understanding of what the technology can do that allows you to create things that they would never ask for, but that will absolutely delight them. So it's one of the most important things you have to think about when it comes to uh, software design. Now, let me just add a corollary that is really about leadership. As a leader, you're going to get lots of input about what you should do in the organization or what the organization should do. And if you're always responding to whatever that is that you're getting asked for, well, guess what? 
one person may think you should do this and another person to think you should do that. One of the most important elements of leadership is to have your, the courage of your convictions. You're going to have to be very well connected to the people in your organization that you're leading, but you're also going to have to really have a vision of where you want that organization to go. And so it is that confluence that will make you a great leader. It's not all about just responding to the last request that is made of you. Okay, last strategy lesson related to office, but perhaps the most important. In the 1980s, when I'd come to Microsoft to work uh, on, on creating Office, we were way behind in applications. Way behind companies that you don't really know about or hear about anymore. Lotus 123 dominated spreadsheets. WordPerfect dominated word processing. Aston Tate dominated database. And we were going to try and go after uh, 123 with a spreadsheet, and we designed it for the IBM PC. And in the spring of 1984, I went to Bill and I said, this is not going to work. I said, we're going to just go toe to toe with them on their turf. What we need to do is take the bet on graphic user interface, the Macintosh and then Windows, and really try and out outflank them. So the first version of Excel, we shifted from being on the IBM PC, what was called character user interface. I don't know if you know character user interface, it's, but if you know command line interface, that was basically what dominated the user experience of computers at that time. Graphic user interface was this new thing that people didn't know how to, to use or think about. So we shifted. We bet on where we thought the future was going. And in addition, instead of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with WordPerfect and Lotus 123 and, and DBase one by one, we said, hmm, why don't we take those three applications, uh, word processing, spreadsheet, database, I guess four uh, PowerPoint presentations, and put them all into one package at a discounted price. So what we did was we bet on a technology paradigm shift the shift from character user interface to graphic user interface, and we bet on a business model transformation from standalone application sales to the sales of a productivity suite. I say this to you because the most important areas of value creation in high tech are when you pair a technology paradigm shift with a business model transformation. And it'll be the, the, the area where you can enter in and win, we went from nowhere to, by 1995, being the clear number one in productivity software. And it also will be the area where, if you are the leader, you can get disrupted and displaced. So of all the business lessons I share with you, that is probably the most important one. The greatest sources of value come from the convergence of a business model transformation with a paradigm shift. How did Microsoft get behind in the whole search area? They did not predict the business model transformation of ad-funded software. That was a mistake. So you have to be looking for both of those, those elements. The last thing I want to talk about in, in strategy lessons has to do with innovations. And I want to dispel a myth. One of the myths is that great innovation comes from a super smart person who sits in a dark room and the light bulb goes off. I want to tell you about George de Mestrel. George was a, I think, a chemist in the 1940s and 50s. He was uh, Austrian. He was an avid hiker. And he would go hiking and he would uh, come back and he'd notice that he had these burrs in his socks and the dog had burrs in the, the fur. And, and he was very intellectually curious. And so he put this under a microscope, like, what's going on? Why, did they, why, is this, why does this happen? And then he had an idea. What was it? 
Velcro. Most of the great innovation in the world doesn't come from the smart guy who sits in the room and the light bulb goes off. It comes from people who are intellectually curious, looking at things in one domain and transforming those ideas into another domain. That is so important for you to think about because you will be much better, much quicker, much more adept at being innovative if you have that intellectual uh, curiosity. So that lesson is be intellectually curious. Much innovation comes from transforming something from one domain into another. Okay, now let me move into leadership lessons. And I'm going to uh, uh, talk about three people who uh, were role models or mentors for me. This first person is John Shirley. John Shirley was the president of Microsoft from 19... 83 to 1990. He was an amazing leader for the company. When John said he wanted to retire, I think Bill was about ready to have a heart attack. And for the two years after his retirement, I would have lunch with John just to see if we could convince him to come back. He was amazing. One of my first meetings with John was related to manufacturing. I was the product manager and we were kind of screwed up and we weren't getting things out into the market. And of course, that's, a, you know, is it product management? Is it manufacturing? You know, it, some elements of the supply chain. I sat in this meeting with John, and he said, and this is with the head of sales, the head of manufacturing, me, product management. I sat, we sat, all, all of us sat with John. And for the next hour, he said, well, what about this? Hmm, what about this? What about this? What about this? Just kept asking his questions, learning, very curious. And at the end of that hour, he leaned forward and he said, now this is what we're going to do. And then we were really screwed up in sales. Trish and I vividly remember him firing the head of sales. Uh, it was quite a commotion in the lobby that day. Uh, <laughs> and John rolled up his sleeves and he figured out how to get our sales organization uh, running effectively. Then he turned his attention to finance and getting our finance structure right, hired the right person to lead that. Microsoft then went public. So there's a very important lesson that I learned from John Shirley. You're going to hear as a manager, you say, oh, you, you, you know, you, you manage through your people, you know. Don't micromanage your people. That's good advice, but let them do their job. What I learned from John Shirley is that great leaders manage through their people and drive important work. John allowed the people to run their divisions, but he knew where were the most important things that we had to either fix or bring as new assets into the organization. And he was willing to roll up his sleeves on those elements. So you as a leader need to think both about how you manage through your people, letting them do their jobs, but also what's the most important work where you can add value and then drive that important work. That's what I learned from John Surely, that lesson. Here's another lesson. Uh, I kind of have to use this as a prop. I, I apologize for those of you in the back. I'm sitting down here in the front. In February of 1984, I had to sit down with Bill Gates, uh, along with Jeff Harbors, the head of our engineering, and explain that we had a bug in Mac Multiplan. Now, Multiplan is a spreadsheet that uh, released coincident with the, the Apple Macintosh. We were very proud of the fact that Microsoft had the first applications out on the Apple Macintosh. But we had this bug, and we were going to have to recall it. And so Jeff and I weren't really sure how much longer we'd be employed. Uh, but we went in to see Bill, and you know Jeff explains how the bug, you know, how we think we missed it, you know. And Bill is just sitting there kind of, he has this tendency to sort of rock and look at his feet. And, and then I explain that uh, the, uh, I explain that, uh, yeah, this is kind of bad, you know. It's a bug where 
uh, people lose their data in the spreadsheet. <laughs> Bill, Bill's kind of looking down and looking at his feet, rocking away, and not saying anything. And then Jeff explains what we do differently in the, the engineering process to avoid this kind of a, a bug. Still doesn't say anything. And then I explain, Bill, we're, we, we need to recall the product. And it's going to cost us several hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money any day, but especially for Microsoft in those days. And uh, plus there's the damage to your reputation. And so <laughs> we're kind of done. We're waiting for the exit of the, the company. And, uh, you know, Bill looks up at us and he says, well, you came in today, you lost $300,000. You come in tomorrow, you hope you do better. That was the end of the meeting. That's about the only thing he said in the meeting. But what he said, what he did was incredibly powerful. He showed that he was a leader support, who would support his people in taking smart risks. We were doing something that had never been done before. We were the first company to really do graphic user interface or Macintosh applications. It hadn't been done. We were going to make mistakes. In fact, later in my career, Bill said the biggest mistake that we would ever make is to try to not make any mistake at all. He was a leader who supported you in taking smart risks and emphasized learning from the failures. If we hadn't come into that meeting with a sense of what we would do differently, maybe we would have been exited from the company. But because we were thoughtful about what we should do differently, uh, he, he really supported us. And I can't tell you how much loyalty he engendered from me that day to him because of the way in which he, he carried himself in that situation. Okay, this leader is going to surprise you. Uh, anybody here in the younger generation recognize this person? Lou Pinella. So Trish and I are part owner of the Seattle Mariners. Lou Pinello was our manager. As you can say, see, he's a very calm, uh, <laughs> serene person. Uh, and I actually had a little video clip I was going to show you about him having one of the famous Lou Pinello meltdowns. Uh, but I decided I didn't have enough time. But I do encourage you to go out on YouTube and look for Lou Pinello uh, meltdowns. Lou was viewed as very emotional. You can see it there. But he was also very analytical. One spring, uh, one, one, one evening during spring training, I sat down with Lou for an evening, just me and him one-on-one, -on -one, asking questions about baseball. I said, Lou, how do you decide what is a major league pitcher versus a minor league pitcher? And he thought for about two seconds, and he said, three things. Number one, they know how to locate their, their fastball. Two, they avoid walks. Three, they have great lateral movement, lateral movement on the breaking pitch. Hmm. I said, Lou, how do you do the lineup? Hmm. Thought for about three seconds. He said, number one, I want on-base percentage. Number two, I want somebody who has on-base percentage that hits the right side. Number three, I want hitting for average, number four, I want power and average, number five, I want power, so on and so forth. Number nine, I want somebody who looks like number one, odd base percentage. This whole evening was like this. Lou, what about this? Three things. What about that? Two things. What about this? Four things. And it's one of the, I reflected on that later, I was leading Microsoft North America, and it occurred to me, that great product managers have the ability to take the complexity of the market, what customers might want, the complexity of the competitive environment, and the complexity of what your product has to offer, and reduce that to its essence, which in product marketing terms is also often called the positioning statement. So what Lou demonstrated in that evening is one of the most important lessons about leadership. Strong leaders take in the complexity around them and reduce it 
to the essence of what needs to get done in order to succeed. And they hammer that message home to their people with focused, clear, and consistent messaging. Similarly, weak leaders take the complexity around them and make it more complex. So if you're ever working for a leader that's doing the latter, I encourage you to run the other way. Go find the leader that is, has that ability. It doesn't mean that they ignore the complexity. It means they take it in and they figure out how to get it to its essence in order to lead their people with clarity. That's just one of many great lessons I, I, I learned from Lou that evening. And you'd think, oh, you know, the guy's a manager of a baseball team. What am I going to learn from him? I was curious, and I could see why he was so successful as a manager on the baseball field. Okay, I'm going to uh, start to uh, wrap up here. I'm moving into the fourth section on lessons, and I'm borrowing uh, and adding to a body of work done by Clayton Christensen. Clayton is a, a very famous, very prominent Harvard Business School professor. He's best known for a book called Innovator's uh, Dilemma, uh, but then he wrote Innovator's Solution. I'm not really sure if it, you know, how it all worked out. Uh, he's very famous, but later in his life he wrote a book called How Will You Measure Your Life? And Clayton had spent all these years researching management and innovation theories to build stronger companies. And he hit upon the idea that these same models can help people lead better lives. They can help you answer the question of, how can I be happy in my career? How can I be sure that the relationship with my family is an enduring source of happiness? And how can I live my life with integrity? So these next set of lessons are a combination of things that I've learned and things that I, I, I've learned from, from Clayton. The first one is really quite obvious. Create a strategy for your life. Have a life purpose. So many people kind of go through life, you know, living day to day, but if you really want to make sure that you achieve those important goals for you, have a strategy. Be clear about your life purpose. Another lesson that, that he talks about is allocate your resources. Your decisions about how you allocate your personal time, your energy, your talent, those decisions ultimately shape your life strategy. So once you get clear about your life strategy, your life purpose, really think about are you allocating your resources consistent with that strategy. Another one that he talks about is avoiding the marginal cost mistake. And it, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to do the short version. For those of you who've taken uh, economics or microeconomics, you know, one of the things that you learn is sort of how to do marginal cost analysis. You think about the marginal return or benefits versus the marginal cost. And you're kind of taught to ignore sort of the, the investment, the sort of fixed costs in the infrastructure around. Clayton actually thinks that's one of the big mistakes that businesses make, and he uses Blockbuster and Netflix as an example. Because you can kind of think, oh, you know, I have a marginal benefit here that's greater than the marginal cost, so I'll ignore all of this, uh, the, sort of the fully burdened costs, if you will. He uses that very same point to talk about integrity. He says, avoid the marginal cost mistake. It's easier to hold to your principles 100% of the time than it is to hold to them 98% of the time. If you give yourself that out, if you say, well, okay, well, just this once, I'm going to go counter to my principles because I see that as a benefit, you're going to regret where you end up. You've got to define yourself on what you stand for and draw the line in a safe place. In other words, with a margin of safety relative to that line. Clayton happened to be a classmate 
uh, Jeffrey Skilling, if you've ever heard of Enron. Uh, this is one of the examples that really got him thinking about that. This is about integrity. So hold your principles 100% of the time. Don't allow yourselves to make the marginal cost mistake. Another <clears throat> element that, that he, he talks about, and I want to emphasize to you today, is remember the importance of humility. This is critical to your success, and I hope to put an exclamation uh, point on it. And I actually, I got to be honest with you, I worry about that with this group. You have grown up being touted as the best students. You were recruited here as the best and the brightest. And so you've gotten all of this positive feedback, which might undermine some of your humility. And one of the things that Clayton teaches is the critical importance of success as leaders of having humility. And so he did some research on what characteristics of humble people really stood out. They had a high level of self-esteem. They knew who they were and they felt good about who they were. Humility was defined not by self-deprecating behavior or attitudes, but by the esteem with, it, with which you regard others. Generally, you can be humble only if you feel good about yourself. And this is part of the reason why he emphasized it as a critical element of success as leaders. You, if, you feel, if, if you're humble, you feel good about yourself, and you want to help those around you feel really good about themselves, too. When we see people acting in an abusive, arrogant, or demeaning manner toward others, their behavior almost always is a symptom of lack of self-esteem. They need to put someone else down to feel good about themselves. So one of the things I want you to think about, with all the amazing talent you have, once you leave the Rake School, the vast majority of the people you're going to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis may not be smarter than you. I know you've come here and you've found a lot of very smart people around you, but when you're out there in the real world, the vast majority of the people may not be smarter than you. And if your attitude is that only the smarter people have something to teach you, your learning opportunities are going to be very limited. But if you have a humble eagerness to learn something from everybody, your learning opportunities will be unlimited. So that's why we want to emphasize the importance of humility. We know where you've come from, we know how great you are, and we know that your continued greatness will come from a deep understanding of humility and you having the appropriate self-esteem for who you are. Clayton emphasizes, choose the right yardstick. Now, this is probably a little bit harder at your age, but Clayton had a bout with cancer. It really caused him to think about his life. He says, assess your life not by the dollars, but by the individuals whose lives you've touched. Don't worry about the level of individual prominence you achieve. Worry or focus on the individuals you have helped to become better people. So now there's another great lesson. Choose the right yardstick. And I'm going to wrap up with a lesson that's very important to Trish and I. It's fundamental to the work that we do uh, in our education area at the Rakes Foundation, but we think it's fundamental to all of you and your leadership. And it's a lesson to always have a growth mindset. Be intellectually curious. Rigorously explore ideas and new ways of thinking. And as part of your growth, uh, as part of your curiosity, have a growth mindset. Suspend your fear of judgment. Don't be afraid to take risks. View mistakes, challenges, and failures 
as learning opportunities. If you have a growth mindset in your life and your career, you can feel like you're driving the tractor every day. So I am very lucky to be a farm kid from Nebraska. I was blessed with tremendous opportunities, great people around me, um, and those were great role models and, and people to support me in my mother's goal of me being the best that I could be. Microsoft was my dream job, uh, the ability to, to co-lead the creation of Microsoft Office, a billion people using Microsoft Office. Leading the Gates Foundation was a second dream job. Working with Bill and Melinda and the Gates Foundation team, saving and transforming lives. And now working with Tricia on our philanthropy and our business interests, giving back, paying it forward, whatever phrase you want to use, that's my ultimate dream job. So I'm grateful for all of the support from so many people around me and the lessons that they helped me learn. And what I hope today is that by sharing these lessons, it will help you find your path to a life of purpose. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I now stand between you and dessert, uh, but there is time for Q&A, and I have this kind of new device I've never had before. This apparently is like the question, uh, question cube. Uh, so who wants to ask the first question? See, I get to throw it to you, and then you talk into it. If it's turned on. Hello. Hello. Sure. All right, I'll just ask it out loud. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there may be a bug here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, sure. Jacob. In your several years with the involvement in the Rake School here, what has been your most fulfilling moment? Yeah. The, the question is, what's you know, the most fulfilling moment for Trish and me with the Rake School? And, and <clears throat> there are so many. I mean, obviously, a big part of it is seeing what all of you uh, can do here with the design studio, et cetera. But ultimately, it's actually seeing what you do when you go out into your, your careers and your lives. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. I, I am super lucky that I get to work with, with David Graff and John Wirtz and Brian Kaiser and, you know, the team at Huddle, I've seen the folks that have gone to Microsoft and Fargo and in Redmond, uh, you know, Colby Thompson, Chris Isaacson, other, you know, basically seeing what you did to take what you have, but then take advantage of what you have here and then shape that into your, your life. That is by far the most fulfilling thing. So, thank you. Next question, do we, do we think we, do, are we set? We should begin. Okay. Are we on? Woo! I mean, that, you gotta say, it is kind of cool. I mean, and it's got an end. Okay, where's the next question? Are you ready? You better duck. Just talking here. Oh, cool. Okay. So, in our innovation processes course, we were asked about the three most important components of innovation. I was curious what you thought the three most important ones were. Well, I shared one of the, the things that I think is really important is to, to look at the, you know, be intellectually curious and, you know, throughout your lives and see lots of different things and see how you, you, you transform them. So I think that intellectual curiosity is very important. I think then having that ability to transpose what you learn in one life, walk of life uh, into another is really important in terms of, uh, of innovation. But let me just add another thing, is it's great to be innovative, but you gotta figure out how to make it relevant. So I might add that. It turns out George Demestral never really made a big profit off Velcro. Uh, it took a long time, it took 10 years before he could kind of figure out the fabric and then another year or so 
before he could figure out the loom to do the fabric. And then uh, the first sort of customer or consumer implementation, it kind of looked like uh, bits of cloth. It, it wasn't very attractive, wasn't very appealing. So he didn't make it relevant. It wasn't until the space program figured out that Velcro would be very helpful for uh, astronauts with bul bulky suits. That, and then, then later, uh, people who were skiing, because again, you're dealing with a lot of bulky suits. And so it took a long time for Velcro to take off, and I think that was part of not really figuring out how to make the innovation relevant to a large part of the market. So those would be my three. I don't know if it fits in with what uh, Steve Cooper wanted, but I'll get a grade later. Uh, okay, next question. Okay, I, I didn't figure out this part of it. Uh, can you throw it to me? Whoa. Okay, I'm sorry, where was it? Great, there you go. Is it, is it on? Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, so, especially with software changing as rapidly as it is now, I mean, in terms of innovating and seeing where the future of software is going, uh, I guess, in your experience, like, how do you know, like, what makes a good idea versus a bad idea? I, I don't know if I'm asking the question very clearly, but... Uh, well, I, you know, the, the question you're asking is kind of a very important fundamental question. You know, what's the distinction between a good idea or a bad idea? Certainly relevance to a, some market is going to be a key part of that. Some differentiation from other alternatives that are out there is going to be a key part of that. I've never been a venture capitalist, although I've made some very good angel investments. Uh, you know, I think that is the differentiating, or, or that's an element, that, or a couple elements that you have to look at in order to judge whether something's going to do well or not. If I'm a venture capitalist, I'll add, you know, do I think that the team has the ability to execute? You know, and that too is a part of whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Because you can have a good idea that can't be executed, so then I guess it's not a good idea. So, great. Let's see how good you are. Okay. Woo. Okay, next. Wait. I must test. Be. All oh, right. Um, so you talked about the importance of having a plan, but also being willing to uh, take on new opportunities. So I'm curious, like for example, you passed up an opportunity at Apple. Um, do you have any general advice for knowing when you should deviate from your plan to pursue an opportunity, or or when you shouldn't? Yeah, it's a very difficult question to. Oops, I'm sorry, I stepped on her foot. Uh, it's very, you know, it's a very. On the one hand, it's a difficult question to answer. On the other hand, it's a simple answer. You've got to trust your gut. I mean, I, I went to interview at Microsoft, actually not because I wanted to work for Microsoft. That sounds strange. But my sister, who I'm super close to, uh, had moved from, uh, to Seattle. And so if I interviewed with Microsoft, I got a free trip to see my sister. <laughs> and and so, so I went up there and interviewed. And, you know, and I said, wow, this place is really amazing. And so that, that you know, and, and so my gut said to me, I want to make that move. You know, it could have been the wrong move. But look, I said, you should have a growth mindset. You're going to, you know, you're going to make some good moves. You're going to make some bad moves. And when you make a bad move or when you make a mistake, you just got to learn from it and, and move on. But I trusted my gut. And I think that's, that's the key. You've got to figure out how to trust your, your gut. It does help a lot if you're willing to take risk. You know, and that, I guess, is something a little bit about my personality. I've been willing to you know, take risk. But I think that's in part because I have an appropriate amount of self-confidence and you know, sort of that work balance type mentality. You know, it's not always going to be you know, happy and fun. There's going to be some days of slogging. But trust your gut. Okay, uh, that might, you might be number two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so what I want to know is, what is your current strategy for learning uh, now that you're like here, right? Does that make sense? No. <laughs> uh, so like, like, like what, I mean, what I'm trying to learn here? Or? Just like in, in, like in general, um, mm -hmm. like 
now that you're like at this point in your career, oh, right? in my career, yeah. Uh, like, how do you like? What is your strategy for learning and growing? Yeah. Now. Yeah, that that is a great uh, that's a great question. I mean, I uh, one of my strengths, but one of my big weaknesses is I'm interested in a lot of things, and so I tend to kind of. Uh, dabble across a lot of things, and I would benefit perhaps if I was a little bit more focused. I'll just give you an example. I have certain views of what leads to better impact in philanthropy. You know, I think you've got to understand systems thinking. I think you've got to understand adaptive leadership. I've recently come to believe that one of the key elements that will lead to better philanthropy is an understanding of behavioral economics. So I read The Undoing Project, I've been running, uh, reading Nudge, et cetera. And so what I try and do is I try and you know, see where I think things are going. It's a little bit of a corollary to what I was saying earlier on career management. You know, for me, having a portfolio of assets where I can use or leverage my learning or understanding of a given domain can help further our work. And so, uh, it w you know, when I'm at my best, I'm taking that in and kind of guiding it, like, for example, on behavioral economics. Uh, but there's a lot of things I'm interested in, so, you know, I'll end up kind of getting distracted, and, you know, one of the things that I have to do is got to make sure that I focus that, that energy. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Okay. There we go. Okay. So you mentioned in your uh, talk how the, your breadth of knowledge was very important once you got to like an upper leadership role. Yeah. But in general, and especially early on in our careers, what do you think is more important, breadth of knowledge or depth of knowledge? Well, I, I like this concept of being T-shaped. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. But you know, the idea that um, you have areas of depth, but you have a breadth of interest. Uh, you know, I think I was a, a, a very good leader for Microsoft, you know, um, things kind of worked out, president of the business division. I would have been even stronger if I'd had greater technical depth early in my career, to be honest. I didn't intend to be in software engineering or computer science. That wasn't, you know, in fact, ironically, when I was at, my, uh, at Stanford, uh, computer science wasn't even a degree. <laughs> it was like a wing of applied mathematics. And so I never intended to get that kind of technical depth. I would have been better off if I'd had more of that technical depth. So those are things that in terms of how you're trying to build your career, you think about, uh, uh, you think about how you're building the portfolio of assets. You know, one thing that you know, I remember years ago I mentioned to the Huddle guys, the way you build a great company is you, you build depth in a given area and then you figure out how to leverage that asset to extend into a new area and then you leverage that asset to extend it in a new area. Well, your career is like that too. You know, so probably early in your career, especially if you're interested in the technology area, getting the technical depth is going to help. But then there'll be a point in time where you want to pivot and maybe the pivot is into a different area. Like for me, it was in sales and marketing, but uh, from the product creation side, but it, for you it might be, uh, you know, business management, or it might be, you know, finance or investment, venture capital. It all depends upon what you think your life purpose is. And so think of it as a portfolio of assets that you're building over time. Thanks. Okay, how are we doing on time, Steve? Is this okay? I know I'm over your... Two more, there's one here and then there's one in the back. Okay, um, you've taken a lot of frightening risks in your history. Um, I've taken a lot of what? Risks, oh, um, yeah. like investing early in Microsoft, saying no to angry Steve Jobs. So how do you know when it's worth it? And like for say for students like us, how do you know when you can quit your J a job and like pursue a startup? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a you know, and the answer to that is gonna vary. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you. One of the reasons why Steve Jobs was not compelling to me was because I didn't like him as a person. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously. Uh, I, I, I sat, I, I was in a meeting one time with two of my colleagues. Look, I'm only 22 years old or 23 years old. 
And he comes into this room, and he just basically pisses on all their work. And I thought, well, who the hell are you to come in and treat these guys this way? I mean, he wasn't like the head of the company or anything. Seriously, he was not. And, and so I just didn't really like some of his demeanor. And so I wasn't, I wasn't attracted to work with somebody like that. One of the great lessons I learned from a guy named Doug Burgum, who's now the governor of North Dakota, he served on the Rake School Advisory Board. He and Catherine spoke uh, recently. Doug taught me that you want to be around people who give you energy and that you can give energy to. Because when you're around people who suck energy, that sucks. <laughs> And, and so part of my decision there was just who I wanted to work with. The people at Microsoft I sensed would give me more energy. Although I will tell you that in my first three to four months, I had a little encounter with Bill where I thought, maybe I want to go back to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that's, you know, it's, that's work balance. I mean, some days you drive the tractor and some days you scoop hog manure. I think how you decide those decisions Ashley is going to be in part, you know, where you are in your life. You know, uh, when I'm 22 or 23 years old and moving to Microsoft, you know, I didn't have a lot of obligations. You know, when Trisha and I are married and have three kids, you know, should we go to run Microsoft Australia? Mm, eh, you know, it's different. You know, and so it's it's going to be somewhat dependent in terms of what the specific question you ask of taking risk. It's going to be easier when you have less dependencies. It might be a little more difficult when you have dependencies. On the other hand, that structure might actually work well for you. You may have that support net. So I can't give you a simple formula, but I can give you some of the elements. Okay, here we go. Going back to what you are saying earlier about philanthropy, how do you think that organizations and companies like Giving Tech will change the field of computer science? Yeah, that is a question I love. Can I just introduce Luis? Yeah, Luis Salazar is here with us from Seattle. Uh, and uh, yeah, there we go, Giving Tech Labs. So some of you, uh, especially if you're familiar with the legal field, might be aware of public interest law. That was a field that was developed 50 years ago that led to uh, a really great asset of our society where you have some legal talent that works on behalf of society, either in public interest law firms or pro bono activities as part of a law firm. There is a movement right now to build the field of public interest technology. In other words, where you have uh, curriculum at, at universities that help people understand how they can do technology in the public interest, social good, how uh, career pathways, how you can go to work for firms that are centered around uh, public interest technology or like what Luis and I like to say, technology for uh, building technology and sustainable business models for social good. And so Tricia and Luis and I think we're on the leading edge of creating a delivery channel uh, for public interest technology, technology for social good. And I, I think much like what we saw with public interest law, that's going to be a huge area of, of growth over the next uh, you know, two, three, four uh, decades. Because as we all know, technology is pretty fundamental to so many aspects of our, our lives. And so I think it's a very exciting area, but it's really nascent. And, you know, Luis and, and us, we're trying to figure this thing out, you know, what's the business model, so on and so forth. I was just at a convening with people from Harvard and MIT and Stanford and others on what the universities need to do to create the curriculum and the career pathways. And so it's an early, it's early, but, you know, Going to work in the personal computer industry was really early too. So I, I, I kind of like that. I'm, ex I'm excited about that. Listen, I just want to say thanks to, to all of you and especially to the students for being part of the Rake School. You are an amazing set of, uh, of people and teams as you work together. 
Uh, I hope that the lessons I shared with you today help you find your life of purpose, but the main thing I want to do to close is just to express the gratitude from Trisha and me for who you are, what you're doing, and for being part of the Rake School. So thank you very much. Thank you.